Well, I'm in Bletchley Park, which, of course, is in Bletchley, uh, Buckinghamshire, and it was here that, during the Second World War, thousands of people worked secretly away trying to crack the German Enigma code, which, of course, they eventually did and hastened the end of the war. Winston Churchill used to come here to watch reconnaissance films, but we've not come here to watch films, we've come here to have a look at what projects them. <laughs> Here we are in the National Museum of Cinema Technology, surrounded by all these great big monsters here, a little bit like dinosaurs looming in on us. But here, we've got the start of evolution, haven't we? That's you know, it's not yes. got to these big boys yet. No. These are all quite small. Now, is there anything that unites them? Well, the fact that all of these are hand-cranked machines from the turn of the century. Oh, I see. Um, so, so, so would they be used in cinemas? Yes, they would have been, used in the old silent cinema. What was, what was this green one? This end. one is a go early Goldmont Chrono. It's a front shutter machine, because you had the shutter in front of the lens in those early days with the uh, cut-off blade plus a flicker blade. Let me just underline this then, technologically. Uh, when you say hand-cranked, you mean that literally. literally. That if anybody wanted to watch the, the film, Somebody had to wind it up. Yes. And that was the end. Well, the and if you stop winding, the film stopped moving. That's right. Yeah. But the projections there to help him out used to have a support from the ceiling, like with a sling, which he could rest his elbow in. <laughs> so his support for like the elbow him. then, eh? Yeah. And, and these, these two, they look the same but different. That's a good example as they come into us when they're donated to us for made of rubbish skips, yeah. etc. Yeah. And this is after the members of the PPT have worked on them and yeah. spent many hours doing them up, stripping them, polishing, cleaning. Down here we've got something. Now, I lifted it up earlier and I thought, I'll move it onto the... It weighs almost nothing. For... This wouldn't go into a cinema, sure. No. This evolved from the professional cinema into a, a home projector. Oh, and see. though it used the same sort of film, they were able to buy this in short lengths at the shops. It's nitrate film, highly inflammable, oh, yeah. and probably they were using either an oil lamp or a candle in the back. So these would be like somebody's Christmas present. That's probably. right. It would have done. Be yes. the equivalent of having a very early television. Yes. I used to get an orange at the bottom of a stocking at Christmas, but it'd be a very lucky child who got one of these. Well, if you were a rich one, yes. Charles, you're you're the chairman of the. PPT, that's the Projected Picture Trust. Why do you think it was necessary to, to form an organisation like that? Well, you? when I was Regional Technical Officer for the BFI, I used to travel the country, and I saw so many pieces of equipment literally going into a skip. Mm. And because they're quite heavy, nobody wants to look after them. So it was decided I, with a friend, uh, John Cannon, who was Eastern Arts Films Officer, we got a little bit of money together and invited the trade and said that we needed this organisation to save projectors because if we didn't do, they would just get thrown away. Yeah, so once you got this idea, Charles, I mean, how did you first start accumulating the stuff? I mean, did you ring round or was it word of mouth? Well, to a degree, it, it was sort of word of mouth. We got to know where things were going and people were offering. But we have one very big problem, storage. We mm. have, it's so expensive. So we have to beg, borrow and steal space. Mm. And the, the, uh, the whole idea is that people keep offering us stuff and we have to reluctantly say, uh, we're awfully sorry, but unless it's very unique, mm. we, we can't take it anymore. We haven't got the space for it. So, Charles, where do you think this, this place can, can go? I mean, is it really just a question of space? You know, you can get the, the projectors as long as you can get the space to, to exhibit them. No, we would very much like our, our own cinema. We would love our own cinema um, to recreate um, as it was in the, in the heyday of cinema, but we realise that that is a dream. <laughs> Now, Frank, what, what have we got here? Because I can see where you'd have your spools of film or whatever you call them up at the top there and down here. This, I'm not sure what it is. It looks a little bit like a fire engine or something like no, that. No, but no, no, no. There you've got no, a sure. disc. I yes. mean, is it something combining a gramophone or what? What's the principle of Sound this? reproduction. The first talk is 
were recorded on disc. That was the only form oh, yeah. of rec recording they had. The records were lar slightly larger than, than normal. Yes, what size is that then? Uh, 16 actually? inches oh, in 16. diameter. Mm -hmm. The unusual thing about this one was that the pickup started from the centre and worked its way out. Yes. But again, the record only lasted for 10 minutes. You oh, see, I see. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, you always had two machines. So you changed over from part one to part two. Turn the record over to part three and continue that way. Back and then and went every ten minutes. A B A B right Absolutely, the way through. Absolutely, right the way through the film. <laughs> you notice this particular machine is built terrifically rigidly, wasn't it? it it's bit, solid uh, looking. That's right. Typically British design. <laughs> you see, that's right. And occasionally, if the needle did jump, the operator would be very quick and possibly move the needle over a little Physically, bit. Physically, with his hand. Fiddle, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Again, he could slow it down with his thumb or just <laughs> increase it a bit with a push so, to get it back into sync, as it were. Is this, Frank, just a museum piece, or could we start it up and will, it, will we hear some sound? It is a museum piece, yes, but it still works. It's been lovingly restored by some of our mm. fellow members, and I just start the motor, you see, and away it goes, and the, you'll hear the sound coming off the original disc. Some young man back in 1946 on the left hand side that is Sergeant Mortimer. Wait for it, wait for it. I think it's better today if you call me Eric. <laughs> Eric, then, 50 years on. <laughs> now, Eric, what were you doing there? Because it just looks in the picture, there's a van behind as if you're taking films around to show people. No, I was part of a cinema section of the CKS, Combined Kinematograph Services, and my unit was a, one of the 235 mil units. We were showing uh, to Indian troops because the, the army in those days combined Indian, Gurkhas, British, I see. the whole lot. So it wasn't just to the, the boys at home, you know, yeah. who'd come away and wanted to see some films of, I don't know, Rita Hayworth or something like that. It could go to anybody out yes. there. Now, when we look at the photograph there, 1946, can you remember what it was you were doing there at that time? Oh, most certainly, yes. One of the most memorable points was arriving in Singapore on the 8th of September from Burma by sea and uh, going to Changi Jail where the prisoners had just been released and showing the, an English film to them. Yeah, the people who the Japanese had kept... kept yes. Uh, gosh. And the film that they, were, they saw was uh, an MGM musical called Thousands Cheer. <laughs> and I bet they were cheering, weren't they? They were cheering. This is where I lost the sound because there were so many of them they broke the speaker cable. They presumably hadn't seen anything for probably four or five of years. Of course not, no. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, did they like it? Did they like it? They wouldn't let me show anything else for four nights. <laughs> <laughs> now, what you've been doing in, in uh, recent uh, years, I suppose, I see, is it finished now? Yes. Yeah. This is, it's not quite the original, is it, that went out to the jungle, but is, is it a, a reconstruction or have you just simply made it work again? I've made it work again, but th we're proud of this at, at uh, Bletchley Park because this is one of the original batch of machines. This is number 316, which was one of the first 650 built. Mm, I see. The one in that photograph is many years later. Yeah. In 1939, the War Office commissioned Gaumont British to modify this machine for the army, yeah. and uh, they were used by many, many organisations on ships, on, on, in schools, for education, anywhere that they wanted a, a, a mobile, a portable cinema. And they look quite relatively light compared with all the other well, dinosaurs you've I got in here. Well, I don't know. Here. This bit here weighs 112 pounds. Does it? In my younger days, I could pick it up and swing it in the back of that <laughs> truck that you saw on the <laughs> photograph. But now it takes three of us to carry it. So it's now permanently on show here, is yes, it? Yes, in our museum. And does it... Does it Still work? I mean, can you give me a little demonstration? Yes, certainly, yes. There we go. There we go. It, it goes like a sewing machine.
Well, that's it from Bletchley Park, where you can come and see pictures, posters and projectors. And, of course, the projectors sometimes move. Oh, and they've got their own usherette. Well, if she moves, well, that would be an enigma. <laughs> Bye.